Welcome back to Otaku Daikun. It's time to resume the lore of Inuyasha. If you haven't seen part one, please do so before watching this. Currently, Kagome's stuck in the modern era, while Naraku sends jewel-infused demons at Inuyasha, along with a healthy dose of wasps to keep Miroku from interfering. Lame! Sadly, Inuyasha's literally not as strong without Kagome around to protect. Oddly, in order to gain strength from protecting her, he has to put her in more danger. Design flaw, I suppose. Thankfully, Shippo takes a shard of the jewel and hides in the well from a flock of wolves, which is enough of a connection to bring Kagome back to the past. With renewed strength, Inuyasha defeats Noraku's minion and gets to meet the wretch face to face. All cards are laid out on the table. Noraku, formerly Onigumo, set Inuyasha and Kikyo against each other to corrupt the jewel. Now that it's back, he aims to gather its shards to become even more powerfully evil. Thus, it's a race to see who can gather the shards first. Meanwhile, Kikyo's living a conflicted existence. In order to keep existing, she must feed off the souls of the dead. Nonetheless, she tries to carve out a peaceful life in a welcoming village, until Kagome's party finds her while investigating the missing souls of the village girls. Knowing the truth, Kagome tries to convince her of Inuyasha's innocence, but cannot quell Kikyo's bitterness. Despite a more amicable reunion, Kikyo wishes to drag Inuyasha to hell with her as a dark, twisted romance. They kiss, and Inuyasha is almost dragged into Kikyo's scheme, only to be saved by Kagome's voice. We got ourselves a good old-fashioned love triangle. It's time to step back a bit and return to the Demon Slayers. You know, the ones inspired by Midoriko, and who handed off the Shikon Jewel to Kikyo. They continued to thrive for quite some time, with their leader having two talented children, Sango and Kohaku. The two siblings were raised in the Demon Hunter's village, trained on how to slay malicious demons, alongside an adorable Nekomata named Kilala, who, despite having a tiny fox-like form, is actually the former companion of Midoriko, making her the oldest in the village. Kohaku was always terrified of demons, but admired Sango's courage. Tragedy strikes during Kohaku's first official demon hunt. You see, Naraku figures out that Sango had obtained a jewel shard from her latest hunt, and so he lures the village's best hunters into a trap. He steals the body of Kagewaki Hitomi, the lord of a castle, and calls upon the hunters to slay a spider demon. Once gathered, Naraku uses his spider webs to take control of Kohaku, forcing him to attack his own family. One by one, Kohaku slays the hunters, with Sango being terribly injured. The village itself, now lacking its defenses, falls victim to a horde of demons abusing the situation. Kohaku himself is killed, presumably ending off the entire demon hunting clan, except for Sango. She manages to survive, digging out of her own grave. Deciding to manipulate her, Noraku convinces Sango that it was Inuyasha who murdered her family. Thus, when Inuyasha arrives at the Demon Hunter village by tracking the demons that decimated it, Sango attacks him. She fights until she passes out from blood loss, and when she awakens, Kagome explains Inuyasha's innocence and Naraku's evil. Realizing who truly killed her family, Sango and Kilala join up with Kagome's party in order to get revenge on Naraku. She shows them Midoriko's resting place, revealing the origins of the Shikon Jewel. When healed, Sango and the group leave the village in search of Naraku's castle. Like a man of culture, as well as a filthy lech, Miroku begins his courtship with Sango by feeling her ass. Kids, don't try this at home. Like seriously, don't. Let fiction be fiction. Naraku, being a twisted prick, likes messing with people's affections. Turns out, Sango's little bro Kohaku is still active despite being killed in the massacre. Naraku revived him with a jewel shard that, if removed, will kill him again instantly. While it's great that Kohaku's alive, he's being manipulated by Naraku, forced to kill innocent people and even attack his sister. Using Kohaku as leverage, Naraku tries to convince Sango to betray Inuyasha, but she refuses, at first anyway. Hoping to rescue her brother, she steals the Tesaiga and brings it to Naraku as payment. As expected, Naraku denies her, instead sending Kohaku to attack her again. Naraku's aim is to corrupt Sango by having her kill her own brother, but thankfully Inuyasha and friends arrive in the nick of time to free Sango from the twisted plot. Kagome wards off Naraku with a sacred arrow, forcing him to flee with Kohaku in tow. In the aftermath, Sango feels she doesn't deserve to stay in the party after betraying their trust, but they welcome her back regardless, understanding why she did it. Naraku desires a newer, stronger body, and sets up a demon tournament of sorts in a mountain cave. Hundreds of demons fall, with the survivors merging with the losers to become even more ferocious. The last survivor will be a fusion of demons formed from a spell surrounding the cave. Naraku intends to inhabit the body of the victor, and is pleased when Inuyasha shows up and enters the brawl, not knowing about the spell. 
Kikyo also arrives, much to Naraku's surprise, and uses a sacred arrow not to slay the strongest demon, but rather to break the spell. The collective demons merge with Naraku, without Inuyasha being dragged in. Being in the presence of so many demons steals away her collected souls, and she passes out, allowing Naraku to abduct her. Naraku keeps Kikyo captive in his castle, using a barrier to deprive her of her soul collectors. He tries to coerce her into being his pawn with the Jewel Shard, but this ultimately fails as Kikyo refuses to take orders from anyone. Amidst a miasma that causes the party illusions, Kikyo steals the Jewel Shards that Kagome had collected and gives them to Naraku, mocking him for his weakness. In this new undead form, Kikyo proclaims she is free to do as she pleases, free from the confines she had when alive, and declares she will slay Naraku only after he's completed the jewel. Well, damn, that was a dick move. Kikyo's very much a wild card, motivated almost exclusively by dragging Inuyasha to an eternal death with her. As if things weren't bad enough, Totosai, the smith who forged Tesaiga, comes to the party and criticizes that Inuyasha is not worthy of the sword since it's all beaten up. He says he can teach Inuyasha how to use the damn thing, but only if he can prove himself against Seshomaru, who just so happens to be threatening Totosai to commission a new sword. Seshi wants a deadly sword, not a healy one. Ironically, though, Inuyasha won't be able to defeat his brother without learning the Wind Scar, and yet, for Totosai to teach it to him, he has to defeat his brother. Damned if you do, damned if you don't, I must say. Luckily, Inuyasha, under all that pressure, succeeds in using the Wind Scar while poisoned, and he nearly kills Seshomaru with the attack. In fact, Seshi would have died if not for Tenseiga's protection. This renders Seshomaru wounded, laying in the forest to recover, where he finds solace in an unexpected source. Enter Reen, an adorable child who is incredibly fearful after watching her family get brutally slaughtered by bandits. The trauma renders her mute, and her fellow villagers find that bothersome, letting her do as she pleases so long as she doesn't get in the way, else they beat and scold her. Because of this, Reen roams the forest unattended and comes upon the wounded Sashomaru. Of her own volition, she decides to help him by bringing him food and water. Obviously, Sashomaru hates humans, so he rejects her help. Even so, Reen continues, going so far as to raid the village storehouse and take a beating for it. Sashomaru finally shows some interest after seeing Reen's bruises, and that concern is enough to make her smile. Clearly, though, life is cruel to the poor girl, and things get even worse when her village is attacked by wolf demons. They chase, catch, and maul her to death. Sashomaru comes upon her bleeding corpse, remembers her smile, and on a whim, draws the Tensega and uses it to revive her. Perhaps this is compassion? Well, Sashomaru plans to just leave her there, but Reen stubbornly follows him and Jokin, becoming an uninvited part of his entourage. After all, Sashomaru is her salvation, as the revival also restored her ability to speak. Kagome's party tracks the wolves to Reen's village and finds all the bodies. When Inuyasha slays the remaining wolves, he draws the ire of their leader, Koga. Koga has gathered three jewel shards, with one in both his legs and his right arm. These power him up to rival Inuyasha in combat. He's distracted, however, when he learns that Kagome has the power to see the shards. Wanting to use this power, Koga kidnaps Kagome and takes her to his wolf village. Naturally, Kagome is pissed at being abducted, and her defiance intrigues Koga. He proclaims his love to her and vows to claim her as his woman. Kagome refuses, but does manage to see that Koga means well for his tribe, and so she helps him out in a fight against the tribe's sworn enemy, the Birds of Paradise. When Inuyasha arrives to rescue her, he's upset by how she's befriending Koga. While no longer enemies, Inuyasha's jealousy prompts him to distrust Kagome, which drives her to go back home through the well. Thankfully, their lover's quarrel is brief. Kagome returns, Inuyasha apologizes, and all is well, despite some comedic antics. More pressing is that Naraku, in possession of the jewel fragments Kikyo gave him, develops a new ability. Through Bunshin, or incarnations, he is able to remove parts of his own body and manifest them as independent beings created to serve him. These incarnations have their own will and personalities, and yet they are restrained by Naraku's command. If they disobey him, he can crush their hearts and kill them at his leisure. One of these incarnations is Kagura, a wind sorceress who reluctantly serves Naraku in order to survive. She yearns for freedom. In contrast, another of Naraku's incarnations, Kana, is openly faithful to him. She is first tasked with destroying the Tesaiga and is trusted with the secrets of Naraku's grander plans and schemes. She carries a mirror which allows her to steal people's souls, reflect attacks, and show events happening all across Japan. Still determined to destroy the Tesaiga, Naraku dispatches a third incarnation, a demon called Goshinki. 
Due to prior injuries, Inuyasha is at first unable to hold his own against the demon, causing Tessaiga to break in Goshinki's powerful jaws. In shock, Inuyasha succumbs to his demonic impulses, going into an enraged demon form. While this gives him the strength to kill Goshinki, it fills him with a dangerous, insatiable bloodlust. Luckily, Kagome's sit-boy command is able to snap him out of it. Inuyasha has Totosai repair Tessaiga using one of his own fangs, causing the blade to be much heavier than it was before. At the same time, hearing of Tessaiga's fracture, Sashomaru gets the idea to use one of Goshinki's fangs in forging an even stronger blade. He recruits the demon smith Kaijinbo to forge the sword, but the resulting blade, Tokijin, winds up possessing Kaijinbo and destroys him from the inside. Sashomaru, however, is a boss and isn't affected by this. He decides to test this blade against Inuyasha, who now struggles finding his own strength in Tessaiga without relying on his father's power. The more fiercely Inuyasha fights, however, the more his demon blood boils, such that Tessaiga is the only thing keeping him from going berserk. Thus, when Tessaiga is knocked away, Inuyasha goes into his demon form and needs to be rescued by the party once more. Naraku is caught spying on Kikyo, and she surmises Onigumo's soul is still inside him. Angered by the accusation that he still has feelings for Kikyo, Naraku attacks her with the soul-devouring giant Shinidamachu. It absorbs all her gathered souls, leaving her weak and vulnerable. In this state, she encounters Inuyasha, who vows to protect her from Naraku. By now, though, Inuyasha and Kagome are developing romantically. Kagome witnesses as Inuyasha and Kikyo embrace, and feels rejected. Clearly, Inuyasha still has feelings for Kikyo, and feels an obligation to see things through, even if it means going to hell with her. While he cares for Kagome, he doesn't think he has a right to be happy after what's happened in the past. Kagome acknowledges this, but loves him too much to see him suffer so. Thus, she insists on being with Inuyasha to bring him the happiness he denies himself, accepting his complex feelings undeterred. They aren't the only ones struggling, though. Kohaku is still under Naraku's control, with his childhood memories seemingly erased. He's used his bait to lure in Inuyasha, making it look like Kohaku has been freed. While the party tries to protect him, he finds himself alone with Kagome and is compelled by Naraku's order to kill her. While Songo is able to stop Kohaku, she fears the only way to truly free her brother from Naraku's control is to kill him and then commit suicide herself. Thankfully, Inuyasha puts an end to that nonsense, reasoning that since he resisted the urge to kill Kagome, he must still have his humanity. If anything, it's because of this humanity that Kohaku is being manipulated, wanting Naraku to erase his memories of killing his own family. Which is bullshit because, you know, Naraku made him do it to begin with. Regardless, Naraku punishes him for failing to kill Kagome by temporarily restoring his tragic memories. Heck, beyond love, Inuyasha still has to worry about his berserk fits that cause him to lose control and slaughter enemies without remorse. Sashomaru suspects that he's not becoming a full demon, but rather just losing his mind like a beast. Still, if Inuyasha continues to suffer these episodes, his demonic blood may fully consume him. He fears that one day he'll hurt Kagome. Seeking a way to prevent further incidents, Inuyasha consults Totosai about how to make Tessaiga lighter. He is told he needs to surpass his father by doing what his father could not. That is, he must slay the dragon Ryuko Tsuse that his father had sealed to a mountain after suffering a severe injury. Since the beast is supposedly dormant, Inuyasha believes he only needs to pierce its head. But when he arrives, he finds that Naraku had already freed the dragon from its seal. Thus, Inuyasha must defeat the dragon in earnest. As they fight, Inuyasha learns that the dragon's skin is too hard for Tessaiga to cut, at least with his current techniques. He once again goes berserk, but manages to restrain himself, knowing that Tessaiga will never get lighter if he wins through such a barbaric method. He regains control, and is pleased to find that the sword has indeed become lighter. Not only that, but he can also see the wind scar at will. Thanks to this, Inuyasha learns a new technique, the Backlash Wave, which utilizes the wind scar between two auras to reflect the enemy's demonic energy back at itself. This succeeds in slicing the dragon to pieces. Now, this is where the first movie comes in, affections touching across time. The gist is that Inuyasha's dad once slayed a powerful demon named Hyoga, and now Hyoga's son, Menomaru, has come back for revenge. He uses a jewel shard to try and regain his father's former glory, consuming countless souls with the aid of his companions Ruri and Hari. Menomaru attacks Inuyasha to avenge his father, while Ruri and Hari respectively copy Miroku's wind tunnel and brainwash Kilala. Kagome is also brainwashed, forced to once again pin Inuyasha to the sacred tree with an arrow. Convinced she doesn't belong in the feudal era, she returns home, leaving the shards so there's no returning. Or at least, that's what she thinks. When she comes to her senses, she visits the tree in the modern era and discovers she can communicate across time with Inuyasha. 
Together, they devise a plan to get Kagome back to the past, and when united, they combine a sacred arrow with the backlash wave to slay Minomaru. All this time, Naraku's been residing in a castle, protected by a barrier while he amasses the bulk of the jewel shards. He abandons the castle for a time, however, giving Kagura the idea to rebel. Believing Sashomaru can sever the connection between her and Naraku, she sets off to find him. She offers Sashomaru jewel shards in exchange for Naraku's head. To her dismay, Sashomaru rejects the offer. Meanwhile, Kagome's party reasons that Naraku and his barrier must be weakening for the same reason Inuyasha does on the new moon. Naraku's Zahanyo are half-breed after all, just with a ton of smaller demons. So yay, Naraku has a weakness, kinda. Turns out Naraku can choose when he becomes vulnerable, and after doing so, he gets even stronger. Kagura discovers this as well after seeing Inuyasha's human form. She tries to return to the castle, as if she never tried to betray Naraku, but Kana's mirror reveals the truth. He threatens to absorb her back into his flesh if she doesn't obey. Sick of falling victim to Naraku's schemes, Inuyasha seeks a way to break through the barrier that protects Naraku. Myoga the Flea explains that if Tesaiga can absorb the power of a bat demon that defends a barrier around its own nest, the sword will become strong enough to shatter other barriers. Sadly, this bat demon happens to be a young half-breed named Shiori. Shiori was born as part of a peace treaty between the bats and their neighboring human village, but was forced to take over the role of guarding the barrier when her father died. Hearing about Shiori's troubled past, Inuyasha refuses to kill her for his own gain. Luckily, it turns out that he doesn't have to kill her to get the power to destroy barriers. All he has to do is shatter the blood coral crystal Shiori's tribe uses. After slaying the more treacherous demon bats, Inuyasha is able to break the crystal and have Tesaiga absorb its blood. The blade turns red. Now that Inuyasha can break Naraku's barrier, it seems the wretched spider is preparing for a confrontation. Aiming to absorb Sishomaru for his power, Naraku has Kagura kidnap Rin. Inuyasha's group breaks the barrier and finds Rin being watched over by Kohaku. Kagura is supposed to stop Inuyasha's advance, but is secretly hoping Inuyasha will kill Naraku instead. Thanks to this, Inuyasha is able to save Sashomaru from being devoured into Naraku's body. The brothers work together once more and fight Naraku, but the battle ends when the bastard tries to get Kohaku to kill Rin. Demonstrating his compassion, Sashomaru lets Naraku escape in order to save her. Naraku disappears, taking Kohaku and Kagura with him. The hunt returns to square one, as nobody knows where Naraku fled to. Eventually, Kikyo manages to get a lead as to Naraku's whereabouts. She meets Rasetsu, the bandit leader responsible for burning Onigumo. He's old and dying, and asks Kikyo on his deathbed to bring a strand of his hair to Mount Hakure, a place where even the wicked can find peace. This mountain is the site where Hakushin, a regretful Buddhist monk, resides. To protect his pupils, Hakushin put a barrier around the mountain to ward off evil, ultimately sacrificing himself to become a living Buddha. Buried alive, Hakushin began to doubt his own resolve, believing that the people wanted him to die. Naraku took advantage of Hakushin's uncertainty, manipulating the monk into serving him. Thanks to this, while the mountain's barrier wards off demons and impure humans, Naraku is able to use it as his base while building a new body to replace the one damaged by Inuyasha and Sashomaru. Kagome's party also heads to Mount Hakure, following Naraku's trail of demonic energy. At this point is actually where the second movie takes place, the castle beyond the looking glass. Basically, Naraku has a rival demon, Kaguya, whom he'd like to absorb. Kaguya was a demon who stole the name and powers of Princess Kaguya, a divine maiden from the moon who came to live among mortals as the daughter of a bamboo cutter. The celestial princess tasked her potential suitors to bring her five items, the begging bowl of Buddha, the jeweled branch of Horai, the robe of the fire rat, the jewel of the dragon, and a swallow cowrie shell. When all of her suitors failed, Princess Kaguya was to return to the moon with a feathered celestial robe meant to help her forget her life as a mortal. Before she could, however, she was attacked and devoured by the female demon now calling herself Kaguya. As such a powerful demon, Kaguya wanted to cover the world in eternal night, but she became vulnerable when the celestial robe was stolen while she was bathing, and Miroku's ancestor Miyatsu sealed her away in her own mirror of life. In order to ultimately absorb the sealed Kaguya, Naraku fakes his own death, pretending to be defeated by Inuyasha's party. Kagura and Kana free Kaguya from the mirror, and help her gather the five items from Princess Kaguya's legend. Kagome's party eventually becomes involved in trying to stop Kaguya's plan, and confront her at her castle. Kaguya manipulates Inuyasha into going berserk once more, but Kagome is able to return him to normal by declaring her love for the half-demon, giving him a kiss. 
as Kaguya is conducting her ritual to freeze time. Naraku makes his move, revealing that he had faked his death and wants to absorb Kaguya's tremendous power. He uses Inuyasha to whittle her down so he can consume her. However, Miroku's staff, fired like an arrow, shatters Kaguya's mirror, allowing Inuyasha to destroy her with his wind scar. To prevent Naraku from reaching her, Miroku swallows her into his wind tunnel, forcing everyone to escape as the castle falls apart. Seeing as how this outing has failed, Naraku flees, returning to Mount Hakure to recover. And that'll do it for part two. Please look forward to part three soon. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this channel, help me beat the algorithm by liking, commenting, and sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and, most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of my anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. If you want to support me directly, there are now three ways that all provide the same benefits. You can click Join here on YouTube, or join Patreon or Subscribestar for access to exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate your fandom!